Hello everyone, and welcome to this Nintendo Life episode 271. My name is NBZ, and um, it's been a little while since we've uh, done like a bit of a regular episode. We've actually both been on a plane for the first time in a uh -huh. while. Normally it's just yeah. you jetting off at the moment, but yeah, yes. I, I was in Barcelona seeing some friends, and you were over in San Francisco, mm -hmm. at GDC, yeah. um, having a great time. Yeah, um, and, uh, and yeah, I feel like... So last episode I did a solo segment, and then the episode before that, what happened? We did it. We did. Um, there was something else that happened, but we've had to. Oh, the jukebox segment, right? Jukebox. So it's been a while since we've talked about video games. Yes. Uh, so uh, so we're gonna try and correct that today and get back to it. But uh, Paul, how are you doing? You're you're in that new house now. In the new I feel house. Feel like you're you're getting there in terms of settling in. But uh, how's it going? Yeah, Bally Junior is starting at his new nursery on Monday. He's already had his settled days, and they went well. So that is. Two thumbs up from me and Caroline because that saves us a very long drive to his old nursery. Uh, well, long drive in terms of uh, UK long drive, not long drive sure, for an yes. American, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, we're getting the house the way we like it. It's going to take a lot of time because we're trying to find the time to... A lot of time, a lot of money. Yeah, because uh. you take leave in order to move house mm -hmm. and then you get behind on a bit of work. And then because Bally Jr.'s old nursery was so far away, we were losing out a little bit of work time in order to just get him to nursery. Mm. So we got behind on more work. So now that he is at his new nursery, we're going to be able to catch up on work. But by catching up on work, because we work from home, it's going to mean we're going to have less time to do actual stuff to the house. So it's like mm. this vicious cycle of like, yeah. are we ever going to get the time? To it's also it? never nice to take off time where it's like, well, I'm not really taking this time off. Like I'm have to do something that is yeah. uh, an obligation that is like, it's not relaxing or taking a holiday or whatever. It's like, yeah, totally. But I mean, that already happens when you have a kid because you spend sure. most of your holiday holidays <laughs> seeing family who want to see right, Junior. See the child. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're already left like, well, that felt like a half holiday. <laughs> uh -huh. I didn't have to do any work. That was great. But I don't uh -huh. feel any less tired. So what's right. Happening? Yeah. There's, but, there is no recuperation yeah. time, uh, which is um, uh, but So rough. it might take a little longer than we maybe first thought, but, but we're mm. getting there. We're getting there. That's cool. Um, Been gaming good. a little bit around the edges. Yeah, absolutely. Always got to get a little bit of gaming in there. Um, so, Bali, uh, what are we going to talk about on today's show? For the first segment, we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing. And the second segment, we're going to do some emails. Absolutely. Uh, back to it. The regular old video game show. So, uh, let's... Back to the pepper grind. The pepper grind. Yes, a good uh, segue there. So, uh, Bali, we uh, both checked out the brand new release from Devolver Digital uh, that came out, uh, made by a solo developer, I believe. R. Eck is the uh, developer's name. Uh, when I was going through the credits, I was like, oh, yeah, one guy made it, which is pretty cool. Um, and it seems like it was a long project, like seven years or something. So, you know, solo development sometimes takes a while, uh, obviously, because if you're going to do that and you don't have it as your full-time job you're probably just doing it in your free time right just chipping away uh and stuff like that so um but yeah this uh this has been promoted quite a bit by nintendo uh it was part of indie worlds in the past i believe and um i think both of us just got curious about it because it basically takes like one mechanic from one of our favorite games mm. ori and the will of the wisps uh which is the kind of drilling through the earth mechanic which in that game you also kind of drill through the water eventually um it's more or less identical mechanic i want to say in ori yeah it doesn't feel too different i don't believe no and so like the the idea in that game was you you got this upgrade that let you essentially burrow through sand um and there were platforming challenges associated with that and you know moments where you're underground uh, and there's uh you know saw blades going past and you have to dodge out the way and like obviously if you're going to make a game like this you're going to do a similar thing and so pepper grinder definitely has a bunch of that stuff uh going on with it but um but yeah bali uh we have both uh played it and finished it it's not too long of a game i think it took me you know, three and a half hours total um it was uh it's a really nice um you know i i do appreciate games that i can play and listen to stuff at the same time it, it has like a good podcast game feel to it and platformers are always good for that um mm. so so i did appreciate that but um yeah it'd be good to uh just get your thoughts uh initial thoughts on this game yeah i i probably took a bit longer i definitely had some issues with that final boss i was just mm. handling it the wrong way and had to stop yeah. and think like why am i doing this i need to have a completely different strategy and then that completely different strategy worked but uh yeah i was really interested how far they'd go with this mechanic and right. in all honesty i 
don't think they went that far with it and it i think the the general pace of the levels was a lot more stop start than i thought it would be and by the end of the game it felt like a lot of the kind of most special unique levels they'd actually veer away from the main mechanic entirely and introduce a separate mechanic that i don't really want to spoil but um so i was surprised at that the whole game was maybe a little slower paced for the most part than i thought it would be uh and i'm not saying i was disappointed that it was slower paced i think what the game's going for it does really well um there's some issues where a lot of the hitboxes around enemies and certain bosses and it's very finicky and yeah. sometimes the animation doesn't clearly it's inconsistent in it's a way inconsistent. Right? Um, um but overall i had a really good time like it's not yeah. a top echelon platformer by any means i would say but it's a really good time and i think if you like platformers like we obviously do on this show i don't think you can really miss this one i think it's definitely yeah. worth playing it's, it's really nice like uh you know i i was tweeting like oh no i haven't finished a game in march just because things have been crazy and, and final you fantasy is, too yeah final fantasy is like way too fucking long for its own good um <laughs> but um but yeah and uh, matt lorigan on twitter was like hey this is pepper grinder game this seems like a pretty good one to he was like yeah i've just played like in an afternoon i was like all right that sounds perfect um so and i was already interested but you can't sell me on a game harder than saying it's two and a half to three hours long and i'm i'm already interested in it i was like oh great like if pepper grinder on how long to beat was eight hours i don't think i would have bought it which i think is like a weird really? backwards way it, it's a weird backwards way in which we approach games as opposed to i think most regular people who play games who are like i need to get the most money for my buck right or, part of the dopamine hit for us is the credits and yes getting having this discussion where we've both beaten the yeah. game and then and rinse and repeat like that mm -hmm. is a, a fun process yeah totally and and so um so yeah anytime that you know i, I know that game is short i'm like oh fucking sign me up baby uh, even if i'm not that interested in it if it, if it was like oh do i really want to play open roads and like turns out i didn't want to play open roads because i started it and i want to play open roads well the things i started it and it was first person uh like without a, a thing to oh, rank yeah, you in the okay. world it's like motion sick because oh, it's uh, the, city. is it gone home uh, yeah, Gone Home's like that as well, right? The Witness. Any game that right. is like a first-person narrative or puzzle thing, it's like, it just, I can't do it because of motion sickness. Oh, I thought so it, it was the same developer as Gone Home. That's what I meant. Oh, oh it, it is. So that's a weird story that's like a whole to do. But yes, okay. Open Roads originally was Fulbright. Oh. Then they had allegations against Steve Gaynor, the head of Fulbright. And so basically what happened is they everyone left the studio and made their own studio and took the game with them and so steve gainer is like on his own just with the fulbright name now essentially so weird it's a weird situation so um and i think that's kind of and why fulbright thinking... made open roads no fulbright no. originally fulbright was the developer but they when they left the studio behind they changed their name to the open roads team so ah. the developer's name is the open roads team um and they are separate now from fulbright right, right. Um, but, so but pepper grinder but Pepper Grinder as a video game. Um, so yeah, it, it's um, I I enjoy it as well, and I think it is a. You're very right to be like it's not a top tier platform, and I, I totally agree with that. There's there's just a certain there's a few things within it that make it a little less streamlined, a little more it chafes a bit at the edges, and I think there's enough of that um, that it it doesn't quite hit the peaks. And I think this was best kind of shown when I first played the uh the initial boss right there's you, you do those first few levels and they're fun and they're enjoyable and like it feels like there's good pace to it and all bosses that sort of stuff. are much tougher than the levels yes the boss game. and the boss just it just is finicky in a way that i didn't appreciate where you know there's three phases to it and it's one of those like you gotta wait for a specific opening as you know Bally, my least favorite type of boss design is like you can't <laughs> damage them except for when it's this one moment um and so it's a lot of dodging around in the sand waiting but like the way that those bullets in the second phase the purple ones mm. track towards your character uh it just it felt a little unfair but also like the speed with which you go around and the amount of maneuverability you had within that yes. kind of thin arc of sand it just felt like the game didn't give you enough leeway to deal with it and so it led to a lot of okay i'm just gonna keep trying to like get into this corner so i don't move but then you know it's it's it, it, I, think I found it frustrating because I was down the bottom on like the right hand side I was like okay follow me all the way up and then the beetle would just turn around and be like okay I guess yeah, just yeah. go through the motions of like going the opposite way up so it'd get all the way up and then you hit his belly um, and 
and yeah and and then and then it does a weird thing where like it's simultaneously a boss fight where you have to wait for something but then also it's a boss fight where you can do way more damage than is necessary i got into a flow state of when i got to the ground and the guy fell off the beetle um i would basically like knock him into the wall but i'd just be standing there with my grinder going and he just ping himself onto the grinder just like wall Mm. bouncing into my damage uh, machine essentially and so i was able to eventually three cycle it so you basically right, go wow. through three cycles of it um uh and that made it a lot easier because i, I found that kind of that hack because i was doing like 40 percent of his health on the first one and then 40 percent on the second and the last 20 percent took one more try but um but yeah i think that was the first moment where i was like ah like this is cool but i, I feel like it doesn't it doesn't quite have the polish um that you would want from a game like this and mm. i think that's that's tricky sometimes right because a solo developer um you only have so many resources um and obviously is is one vision that they have but sometimes like it doesn't completely work uh, all mm. the way and and i think that's it's kind of what this game is because i do i think you can see the love that's gone into it you can see the years of work because like like you said there are mechanics that get thrown in and you're like oh wow this must have taken ages to like program and put this in here like this is a totally different thing and a different mode of play um that yeah. this this level is built around um and yeah you can see the the love that's gone into it but but yeah you're you're right in that sometimes that distracts from the core enjoyment which i do think the core enjoyment really is zooming through sand bits quickly and collecting all the gems and the sat there's a real satisfying sound effect of like collecting all the gems and then moving on like even though i knew that at the end of the day i wasn't really going to spend these gems i wasn't going to buy a lot of outfits or whatever like i bought one out for the beginning and changed my hair and then i just stayed that for the rest of the game um I, I I still there's still an inherent dopamine. I think this is why Mario is so successful. It's like collecting coins in Mario, it's fucking pointless. Like it just doesn't matter anymore. But you still want to do it. You still want to do it because there's a joy in getting the thing and hearing the noise and seeing the thing disappear, right? And and that's what but they're like they're like the the yellow paint of 2D platformers as well. Right, coins. yeah. I think that's for me that's their main use a bit like the gems in this game for example Mm -hmm. and yeah i I agree with you about that boss like i think there's some finicky parts and i found that just the pure hitbox of like hitting the beetle like it wasn't always clear it was very inconsistent especially because you have to there's there's a a mechanic that i think is a little uh it sometimes just doesn't feel like it worked properly which is jumping out of the sand which is where you get the blue Mm. kind of effect on your character and you can go much further and there's definitely parts later where there's like a kind of grapple mechanic and you're grappling and going into and you're grappling and you're going into and those were the moments where like the a or the jumping out of the sand if you mess that up you had to restart a whole sequence again and it just felt like that there's just an inconsistency to when you pressed it um, yeah you know so i also find like the base mechanic now i feel like i need to kind of go back to ori all of the Wisps and feel see how that feels but the base mechanic reminded me of the very first time that you're playing mario galaxy and mm. you're on a spherical sphere (laughs) and a Uh sphere and um you go on you're running around this small planet and you run to the opposite side and then all of a sudden because you're on the opposite side and then you let go of the analog stick and then move again the controls almost reset and you kind Mm. of go off in a direction you weren't expecting so kind of the game kind of kind of trains you into not removing your finger from the analog stick and Yes. continuing in a certain direction it's kind of the feeling when you're grind pepper grinding underground uh-huh. and you kind of it's ste- you're st- and one at certain points it feels like you're moving the analog stick in the direction of on the screen you want to go and other times mm. it feels like you're actually steering a bit like a car and yeah sometimes it feels like it flips between them especially when you go out of the sand and then into the sand again and this happened this was right. one of the issues i had on the final boss like you're going right out of the sand into the sand constantly yeah. and the controls for being out of the sand versus in the sand are very different and as a result mm. i was nose diving to my death constantly because yes. i wasn't it wasn't clear to me and i hadn't really done it much in the game up until then right that feeling of going out out of sand into sand out of sand and into sand again like it wasn't very clear and i don't know i just needed a little more 
if that's what a, a key fo- focus of the game is going to be, I needed to do it more to get good at it rather than have that just kind of appear at the end of the game. Like, it felt right. very tough. Um, that second oh, phase in particular, where it's so yeah. easy to fall to your death, there were so many moments where I would pop out of one side of the screen and try and hit one of those balls at the other side yeah. and i would graze it and fall to my death because yes. i hadn't been trained properly in what the momentum should Absolutely. be to yeah. get across so that's a really good point yeah I, I definitely feel that it made me on that final boss slow it right down i essentially had four moves that i knew uh-huh. i could pull off to get from orb to orb without yeah. dying and i just had to repeat those again and again and again yes. and again um going from my safe zone to safe zone to safe zone across him doing damage and that was the only way like um yeah it doesn't reward kind of reckless play that right. stuff which is it, it feels in many ways this game feels like sonic the hedgehog right like there is a it's antithetical to the idea of the the trailers arguably right. where you're speeding on the ground and doing a yes. thing when really a lot of these levels and especially some of those boss fights like we just said are much slower and methodical yeah, you, you need to be careful because you have such limited health that any slip of the finger means that you're going to die very quickly. And so, yeah, like it, it has that feel of Sonic where like the dream is, oh, I'm going to be blitzing around and I can hit this boss a bunch of times. And I'm sure speedrunners can pull that off, right? Then they mm, know all yeah. the momentum stuff and and know the patterns by that point to where they are just zipping through these things like nothing and they're never going to fall to their death. But when you are playing it for the first time and you're trying to figure it out, you do have to step back from that and think, okay, yes, this momentum stuff feels cool and fun, but I'm dying because I keep messing it up. And so it's actually better for me to just stand to the side while this attack happens, then do the safe jump across that I know I will make and hit him in the middle as I do that, right? Um, And so it, yeah, it does lead to a little bit less excitement, I would say at the end. But I think by that point, especially because the way the bosses are tuned, you're almost like i just i just need to get through this because it it feels like some of the levels are super easy and very easy to get through and then some there's one end game level in particular i was like oh my god this is this is really kicking my ass but um but i think the thing is like i i was still enjoying myself the whole time right um there wasn't i wasn't that frustrated i had to fight the boss a bunch because i was like inherently i still like moving around and this the core mechanic just feels good in a way that i just i enjoy it i was frustrated on that final boss's second phase until i worked out this is how i stopped killing myself constantly yeah until then i was like oof, i'm not vibing with this end game Mm -hmm. i agree the other bosses as finicky as they are in part still has a really good time and i didn't mind the challenge and i kind of got used to the kind of wavy floaty nature of the movement like it kind of do you think it's interesting that all the enemies in this game are narwhals i didn't even really notice that i was like oh okay so they've all got that horn they all got the horn um I feel like it's a reference that we're like a dolphin and the enemies are narwhals because you're kind of doing oh, the dolphin right. dive, echo the dolphin kind of thing. I don't know if... They're like sa- they're sand whales, essentially, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I right? don't know if I'm making that up or... That makes sense, though, right? Because they do, some of them burrow into the ground. Like, initially, when you come across those enemies, they drop out those nests in the sky. Yes. And they burrow down and they kind of chase you. The sand is water in that sense. Yeah, and so they are yeah. essentially sand whales, right? So Yeah. Yeah, and I like think i think that smart. the whole look of the game is incredibly devolver like it's really weird i'd say it looks really nickelodeon in many ways mm. like it's just got this really zany art style the world being building is so bizarre and like it, it, yeah it's, it's a far more um honest and naked pixel art style than i think yeah. i'm used to seeing these days and i, I do appreciate it like there's it's interesting because it feels like there's elements of 3d in there like crunchy pixel art that also has kind of rotary elements to it like the the enemies feel like they have a bit of depth to them which is interesting yeah. um and the world as well which i i, I enjoyed quite a bit yeah um, definitely and like the sound design on your pepper grinder like the engine and the grinding sound and the vibration of the switch pad like felt that all came together really nicely like it's a real yeah, playing a handheld feel. with hd rumble was super nice mm. like it just yeah, it, it's satisfying to to go through the the sand and 
have that feedback as you are as you're pushing through it right like i think it it comes together really nicely from a from a feel and from a just aesthetic perspective i think it's it's all really good um did you go after the kind of coins in the levels the kind of marrow galaxy like the green coin medals um because there are levels hidden behind mm. those so if you have 10 Lots coins then you can buy a key and the key unlocks one bonus level per world i believe i don't know if there's yeah. any more hidden levels i missed but um i i found that you know i had enough key uh, coins uh, for each world by the end where i was like oh i actually kind of have a surplus here so i don't mind it in, in this way because um there are certain games where it does that and it's like it's always a struggle to get the required amount and usually in those cases i just ignore it because i'm like ah oh, just i hate this form of unlocking stuff but because there was an added there's an added like level of scrutiny that you had to apply to levels to find where those coins were i enjoyed the process of finding them i, I really enjoyed the process of like looking for the cracks in the wall like the little parts of the textured environment mm, where you can see fun. the slight crackling and it's super satisfying to drill into that and open up the space and be like oh i got a coin for figuring that out and, and for being smart and scouting that that was there um so yeah in this case i didn't mind the fact that i was you know collecting those coins in order to unlock the extra levels and to be fair the extra levels are really cool like they have different mechanics to them and they yeah. they feel worth going after because they it's new parts of the experience they're not just recycled stuff it's like oh, here's a brand new mechanic or idea that's being thrown in here like, i enjoy it yeah i i really appreciated the coins and i tried to get them where i could and i say on average i maybe got three out of five coins per level if you yeah did an average across the whole game and i think i unlocked three out of four of the bonus levels and okay i didn't really go back and yeah i like also how you can get like custom hair and outfits yeah. and so you can just focus on buying the levels but if not you can then just spend your money on outfits and things and is it the purple hair you always go for or the green hair uh i i actually went uh i so the very first shop i bought the black hair and the yellow uh, poncho and i just stayed with that the whole game I was like oh this looks really cool actually i like i like nice. the look of that character so i just kind of kept that for the whole game like the green um, hair and then the orange hair for a while but yeah just just stuff like that's really nice yeah it is i i was worried at the beginning because i was like oh am i gonna like i didn't want to spend coins on outfits because i was like but i want to keep the coins so i can spend them on keys to unlock those levels and by the end i was like oh i have way more coins than i needed mm, actually to right. unlock all those levels so so it worked out but um but yeah then i didn't really go back because by that point in the game i was like i don't need to change what i look like i'm happy with this did you go into it wasn't the menu but the there's one menu where you change your outfits and then there's mm -hmm. another menu next to that where it's so i don't really understand you could go into other levels and they were like level editors or something oh, weird i, I did didn't you, find that at all no find that? i don't no. even know what it was i okay. can't work it out because you go I, into it so there's, every... there's stickers you can buy as well in the game as part of the shop yeah um, I, and i saw the creator online being like oh i loved super smash brothers and so these stickers are like my trophies and you can all right yeah i liked the whole um you stick money in a uh gacha pond right and then you yes get this. yeah, yeah. I, I i do quite like collectible stuff like that like it's, it's kind of fun but um yeah i just couldn't work out what these levels were i still have no idea so i need to look that up but it, it was very strange yeah I, I think he said something about like um like a, a stage that you can set dress essentially with stickers so maybe that's ah, what it was okay um, that makes sense because i think just to take like a screenshot like something yeah from a, okay yeah exactly like i think just like a fun you know cosmetic thing to like if people want to engage with that or get 100 percent, everything on the level was d like the, all the descriptors were images and arrows and things not there right. was no like actual writing like you had to work ah. out it was very strangely okay conveyed um hmm. so yeah well curious yeah i didn't i didn't really find any of that but um but yeah i think um th there's a shortness and a sharpness to this game that i really appreciated i do think um like sometimes the checkpoints were a little bit far between yeah. you know um uh, it didn't get to the point of like super frustration but there was moments of like ah that this last thing you're asking me to mm. do is the hardest part of this and i it just takes me so long to get back if to it, the basically. levels were as hard as the boss fights i would have found that quite frustrating but yes I, I, but i don't think they are they're not i i don't think this game barring the boss fights is that difficult and no. even the boss fights um i got there in the end um but yeah it's it's it is a real ideal length for what this game is going for, for sure. And it's not like we're coming to this game having played 
so many long platformers and come away from those no. games and say, oh, that, that game's so long. It's like they they knew what the limit was in terms of fun when it came to this mechanic. And I think they absolutely nailed that, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, you know, there's there's fun ways of breaking the pace up because I do think a game that is purely just grinding through the dirt eventually you hit a point of diminishing returns with that mechanic and you can do a lot of different fun things with it but eventually you're gonna be like okay um i need to do something else and so i did i do understand why there are enemies in this game i was gonna say like one of the things that i know you've talked about previously is like games that are that have bosses but not enemies right mm. like and i think this is kind of a good example of that where i think it almost would benefit from that in a way but then you know it's fun to have those levels where you do have the gun arm instead and you are just like basically just machine gunning yeah. people down um and sometimes that can get a little frustrating the the one elevator section i'm thinking of at the very end where i'm like oh my god like just you have to concentrate your fire in such a specific way in order to take down these enemies with the the triangle helmets and stuff like that but um it's, it's a nice pace breaker at least and it just kind of freshened things up a little bit um but i do i do think that this game almost is better without enemies because like you were saying there's a bit of a weird hitbox thing and sometimes like i don't know where to jump on them from and sometimes jumping yeah. from above doesn't quite work and i get hit by an axe which is being held above their head but the way they move the axe just doesn't allow for like where am i actually gonna no, we're talking about very small um like characters on screen yeah like it's very difficult to animate that small number of pixels in a way where it's very clear where the hitbox is meant to be right. and we're not talking about like a goomba and mario jumping on a goomba with a big hitbox you know like that's yes. a very clear thing sometimes i killed enemies and i didn't know how or why i had versus others yeah and that's never a good feeling yeah because sometimes like things would die in one hit and sometimes things would take like three hits and i i was like what what's the consistent there's no consistency here which i think was a little confusing but i don't know do you, do you think that's that's a correct take that this game would be stronger if they kind of issued enemies from the equation and, and focused a bit more on just pure platforming um i think from a purely mechanics let's get from a to b and have a good time on purely mechanics perhaps but i do think the whole novel thing was just mm. weird and zany and definitely adds character to the game right? adds character and that's kind of what Devolver are all about in many ways is that mm -hmm. kind of character. So I think on the whole, I'd rather they were in the game. Um, but maybe I just wanted a couple of levels that really focused on mastering the the, the main mechanic in a, in a non-boss setting where it's just like, right, you have to now weave through all of this and then pop out here and do this thing. And I maybe didn't feel that enough. And most of the difficulty was tied to dying to enemies in bad ways which was like oh this didn't that didn't feel good um it was yeah. the levels where i was dying because i platformed incorrectly felt few and far between in comparison to oh i've been killed by that, that enemy again 100 um, percent, yeah and yeah. that's a little frustrating I, I i mean that aside to the bosses which is separate. yes yeah exactly yeah there's just, there's just a bit of an inconsistency there sometimes but um but yeah there is there is fun in like the moments where you are jumping between things and you kill a flying enemy as you get from one spot to another mm. right um that's cool and yeah i always like you know uh, a kind of gauntlet thing of like okay i'm i mean i'm circling around this circle as i wait for the the kind of spinning spike ball to give me the right timing window yes. to jump into that one like it's a sa sense of satisfaction there that I, I enjoyed but um but yeah as much as i was collecting a lot of the gems early game and kept doing it when i died by the end i was like ah this just is not it's just not worth it it just doesn't doesn't make sense to like constantly try and do that when i'm just trying to speed run back to where i i died initially um so so yeah eventually you you reach a, a point of like ah, i just want to kind of get on with it but um but yeah i think it doesn't outstay its welcome like it, it, it mm -hmm. has enough ideas in there um it's only four worlds right i think there's four yeah, different yeah. worlds and each world so has often worlds it has they have to be six or eight worlds you know yeah. like that's so rare to have four worlds which i think mm -hmm. is quite nice and like four to five levels depending on if you do the bonus one as well um yeah uh, I, I i definitely felt like i i could i kind of breeze through it in a way like i i started it um one evening and played like the first two worlds and then the next evening i i finished it basically so it was a really really easy game to jump into and just knock out mm. and just you know it was, it was, it was great and also uh, i played it pretty much majority handheld i think the final boss i did on the big screen just because just the finickiness of it required uh 
a bigger controller for me but um but yeah for the most part i was playing it handheld and like again i think i said it last episode where i was ranting to myself but i said um fucking i do not for one second regret a single pound that i spent on that switch oled holy shit well nintendo have saved you they've delayed the switch too yeah, exactly so. i'm so i'm honestly i'm thankful i'm thankful that they didn't make me waste my money but like <laughs> man like i i could never go back to an original switch holy they're gonna shit make you. they're gonna make well, you well okay so here's the thing the, the original switch the actual other drawback of it is how small the screen is like mm. the real the real estate that you lose going back to an original switch it's actually massive like the the amount to which the the oled fills the entire frame is like oh my god like i was missing this my whole life you know as soon as you you see it like you feel like a changed person honestly like the and i i I know this has been said a lot and it's i think i just didn't believe people when they were like oh my god it feels like a real upgrade like i cannot express enough to people how much fucking better the oled is than the original switch especially for someone like me who mainly plays handheld um it's just such a beautiful upgrade and yeah i am very glad uh, i don't regret that purchase because a game like pepper grinder so colorful and bright and has such a vibe to it it just pops beautifully on that screen so it's just a lovely thing to sit down have a podcast on my computer and be playing pepper grinder as i just kind of go through the evening so yes it was lovely i really enjoyed it a lot and um you know has has its, its flaws and i think you know ultimately doesn't go up there in the pantheon of the great platformers but it's enjoyable it's a good fun time and i definitely recommend people check it out and not too expensive either right it's like um 13 pounds on the e shop, yeah. right which is it's correct. a good price i think for yeah. a platformer um and uh yeah uh good stuff any final thoughts bally on, on pepper grinder before we move on uh i had the sound cut out on the final boss oh okay uh, it was on the second phase so there's a checkpoint it, after the first oh, phase i forgot to mention it is a little buggy um so the third boss in the you know the person who's like the same size as you yes uh, that boss um my character got stuck in the ground but i could still move the drill around on its own so i beat that i didn't actually fight that boss i basically just beat them uh, without being able to move my character so my character didn't take any damage and i just i just chased them with the drill until they died yeah, and didn't have to dodge yeah. anything or i didn't actually have to, have to engage with that boss at all also happened with the final boss on the first phase where he just froze in place i got that yeah and i just killed him and then it moved on to the second phase i was like oh, okay yeah <laughs> cool i guess so. i got that yeah. but then he froze and then i went through him and he killed me instantly it was weird oh, even though he froze, weird but yeah um, so yeah the, it is a bit buggy again it's, just, it's only just launched so i'm sure it's going to have those bugs but yeah very small issues and um i had a great time i i i was really busy with caroline's mum visiting um so i was really not having much time to game at all and this mm. was just such a nice game to just play a level before bed it'll take like 10 minutes nice. let's just play a yeah. level and then play another level when i wake up in the morning did you pick it up for handheld at all or are you still just full lock on a, a TV for, for playing stuff at the moment? I played it all handheld barring like three Oh, levels. wow. Yeah, yeah. But that was just the nature with um, having visitors. So Yeah, yeah. Um, I well, would have played it all uh, at the TV had right. we not had visitors. But yeah, so it yeah. was just a nice little little thing at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it also just says, you know, how high the bar is for this type of game for us at this point you know like you really have to be like peak of the mountain to uh to to do well in this genre space and um yeah it's uh it's it's tough um but yeah what was the other devolver one that came out last year gumbrella gunbrella which we never got around to Not, never yeah. got around to it but i feel like it got an identical open critic score it's like high 70s yes. or something so that's another one i want, want to try right seems like a similar thing where you know they're, they're publishing these games that i think back you know a few years ago they would have got way more attention than they mm. get now but because of how saturated everything has become and how many games there are and how many quality games there are i think stuff like this where it's like yeah it's probably like an eight out of ten i think a lot of people look at that nowadays and they go i, I don't have time for that you know um yeah, yeah it has to be a celeste it has to be a hades it yeah. has to be something that everyone is obsessed with that it's like well i've got to drop everything to check this out in order to make that punch through and yeah yeah unfortunately this just it's just not up to that bob so which you know most things are another platformer getting a very similar score uh is penny's big breakaway which is yeah again, yeah exactly I'd love to try but again i think the game's like nine hours long so or right eight hours maybe so yeah yeah you know, it's quite a big time commitment in comparison but i'd, I'd like to try that again as, as yeah. well this year at some point i don't know 
yeah i think i think that's the thing right it's like finding the time to wrap back around to some of these games that like they they scored okay and we were kind of interested in them but like you know to get to that thing there's there's so many 10 out of 10s that you still have you know to, yeah, to check yeah. out beforehand you kind so. of have to do the deep dive on that genre like we really right. like 2d platformers so that maybe like we will play these at some point it's exactly just a question yeah of, of when but yeah. as you say there's those of 10 out of 10s like balatro and uh-huh, final sure. fantasy yeah, and, yeah. You know. oh, yes final fantasy yeah definitely a 10 out of 10 but video game um <laughs> not many yeah. highly rated games this year to be honest like no there were a lot in january february but it's gone a little quieter so we'll see what yeah. the rest of the year is like yeah i think it's a good, a good year to catch up on stuff right definitely, it feels yeah. like it is so um it's my yeah. catch up on the Elden ring yeah that's that's yeah. The oh AMD, boy right? god that dlc is actually i was gonna say like man we've got loads of time to play stuff but fucking Elden ring dlc <laughs> will probably take three months off my life so mm. yeah well we'll see how that goes um but uh but yeah that, that's the main thing i've been playing i've been dipping into some other things here and there but bali you on your streak of trying to have a goatee to coatee list that isn't anemic this year, <laughs> uh, going, going, going well. for some it's going, going well. for some classic games that um you have not gotten around to yet. Yeah, I I've beaten Limbo. Yeah, uh, by Play Dead. So it came out way back in 2010, which yes. is wild. I believe I played Limbo on the PlayStation 3 through PS Plus, maybe oh, like a year after it came out. I want to wow. say. So yeah, it came to like Switch in 2018. I want to say and um. Yeah, I played this like half of it on the plane to Barcelona and then the other half on the plane back from Barcelona and then I had like nice. six levels left that turned out to be incredibly difficult uh-huh. um, and definitely needed a guide for those final six levels. But uh, yeah, I think the I had a really good time with this game. You know, I uh, people know my thoughts on Inside. Uh, I didn't like the ending of Inside. And for other reasons, I didn't really like the ending of uh-huh. Limbo, I guess. Yeah. So inside there was more narrative and the themes that I didn't love yes. the ending. Um, and this game, I think the difficulty just went bananas in the final kind of six puzzles. As I it remember were. that last puzzle and being like, I would never in my fucking life do this myself, you know? There's, a, there's definitely a few I looked up and definitely came away with the same thought. Like, I would never have got that. i had like a youtube video being like okay what's the angle here and how do i do this weird upside down thing and like Oof, yeah i finished yeah. it but i think by the end it left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth at bit. that point so um yeah but i will say i do think overall the puzzles are really good they're really strong um they are strong i will stand back and say they are stronger than a game like planet of lana like i still love that game probably a lot more than limbo and i think that speaks to how i'm a sucker for presentation aesthetic theming. is big for you right yeah. pardon aesthetic is aesthetic, a big factor uh, right the trees can't forget about those of trees course, in yeah. planet of lana and i prefer that to the you know dark creepy worlds with mm. spiders and limbs that you tear off and oh, yes boy. mechanically the puzzles are superior but i really like the kind of the suggestive plot of planet of lana and mm-hmm. this kind of thing like that just kind of uh works better for me equally um cocoon was just like yeah. not really narrative at all but that was a game that was so mechanically pure and strong that just i am still a sucker for amazing mechanics when they're done in a way that i like which is what i'd yeah. say about cocoon but yeah but also then, cocoon is also like aesthetically exceptional oh, also yeah. right so it's there's there's that perfect too. it's perfection but um mm-hmm. yeah limbo is just kind of really gruesome and like dark and i don't mind that um i th- I would just would have come away from this so much more positively had uh the ending just been a little bit easier and it makes me yeah, think I... sorry go ahead no no I was, I was just interested like i wonder how much that aesthetic question would have changed had you played this at the time it came out because i think back then like that whole black and white kind of that stark uh monochromatic style was not like it hadn't been done to death you know like mm. at this point every video game mario wonder included has done like monochromatic levels where you're you're yeah. dark and the background is light and like it was it was a very striking bold visual identity at the time um and i think for me it's it something that kind of stood out i was like wow this is super unique looking um i think carried a lot of my experience with that game because you know i think like you're about to say the the 
kind of the puzzle elements of it eventually got to a point of frustration with me where i was like i'm just ready to be done with this and i yeah. i didn't enjoy the final part of it but there is a lot of good leading up to that right Definitely. there's a lot of really good cool interesting puzzles that play with the visuals in that way like i think of the spider leg at the beginning yes. right like it's a very, very distinctive thing that you... very distinctive thing that you remember that sticks in the brain because of just the way it looks and the way that it is framed and the sound design and like it's yes gory and ugh, yeah mm -hmm. um and yeah the the art style as you say like this black and white thing has been done to death and it donkey didn't... kong right the tropical right. freeze and but, returns so as a result that. probably from all these different games um it didn't really do anything for me like the 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 cool stuff is the level design and the spiders like we were saying and i was really proud of the fact that like, i played so much of this game on a plane because on a plane you do not have internet you cannot look up solutions right so yeah oh god i like got all the way to the final there's like chapters in this game it was like i don't know 30 maybe 35 chapters i did all the chapters barring six i'd say uh, without looking at a guide by doing the one on a plane. And it makes me wonder, who was this game aimed at difficulty-wise? Because if you're someone who was would be able to get those final six puzzles without a guide, I can't help but think you'd find the majority difficulty, the, the difficulty for the majority of the puzzles, just very boring and very easy. Um, now, maybe lots of people love it, it that easy, but I found most of those fairly challenging and interesting and satisfying to accomplish but then as a result i found those final six levels just way too hard so I'm, I'm interested like how what was the median gamer's experience of getting through this game and using guides or not because it is it gets really hard but at the same time i think those first few puzzles are really not overly straightforward but they're very solvable and very satisfying to just kind of explore your way through and get to so it's it was weird i think people were also more patient back in 2010 as well right which it's been a long time since this game came out and um you know this was one of the first major like indie hits um of its time and so i feel like there was um i feel like a lot of that stuff probably got brushed under the rug right like the way that it spikes in difficulty at the end and all that sort of stuff i feel like today we would have criticized that a lot more than was thought of at the time in terms of when it came because you know when limbo came out it was getting nines and tens across the board from everybody mm. and um i think you know rightly so for the era and the the time and place in which it came out Definitely. but but yeah i think um you know the subsequent stuff that's come from the minds behind this game has just been stronger and stronger right like i think i do think inside is close to a perfect game i think mechanically it's so superior to limbo and oh, really? the puzzles oh yeah i think the puzzles and in inside are just phenomenally good um and i also just love i love the ending like we're very on opposite spectrums of that of like just i love the the bizarreness of it and there's a there's a beautiful kind of like singularity to the vision of it um but i do think cocoon's a better game as well i think like every game has improved from that point and they've got to this point now where like obviously yeppa carlson and his team separate to play dead with cocoon has made an experience that is so perfectly balanced on that puzzle level to where there is no chafing at all right um, mm -hmm. and you just don't feel any of those hard edges which i think limbo still displays a lot of those hard edges right yeah definitely um yeah, I, I definitely think other than those six puzzles at the end, um, I did find the puzzles kind of in in line with um, Inside. To be honest, like mm. I I am probably di dif probably different to you on that area, um, but I do think Inside is a very slick. It is slicker. I'll give you that. Like it is slicker than Limbo, um, and I actually really like the way Limbo ends. I was like, oh, oh, okay, right, right, yeah, and then yeah. We're, doing this okay right yeah um, so that, i i found that really interesting but uh glad to have played it a very good go t t to go t game to play add to the list and it'll, it should feature how, how do you feel about um how do you feel about the child death in this game <laughs> like oh, i God, feel like right. there's there, there was a conversation back in the early 2010s about you know uh, tomb raider uh, 2013 came out and there was a lot of conversation of like the brutal ways in which you see lara die and i i, I feel like limbo got brought up a lot in that conversation of like 
it's just kids and like they're just falling on spikes and being like you know skewered and like horrible ways to die just constantly throughout this game i feel like it's something that was a conversation back then but i don't know if it even sticks out now because like there's been so much of that kind of chatter around uh, and it's kind of moved on in that way it fits in well for the game i'd say like it's mm. going for a very dark vibe and what's more dark than killing children on spikes oh, sure um so uh-huh. yeah, yeah i get what it's going for i think it works perfectly for what it's going for mm-hmm. does it mean it's aesthetically my perfect game absolutely not like i'm, no. I'm not into all that of course but yes. i and i can you can handle it because it is that black and white thing it's not there's like a removed a photo- it, right? realistic game yeah. right it works um i think if I thought this game was mechanically perfect, arguably there might be aspects of the aesthetic that might hold it back in my mind. And that's mm-hmm. where Planet of Lana is just the complete opposite, where totally, the aesthetic, yeah. the music, the vibes, the trees are just uh-huh. top, top, top tier for me that I just love. Having said all this, I don't think even Planet of Lana made my top 10 last year. But um, right, yes. yeah, it's, it was obviously Cocoon did. Um, so yeah it's that it's not all about aesthetic but arguably when a game is as dark and gruesome as limbo can be there's aspects of that that make me feel a bit ugh, a bit yucky a bit i don't know a bit turned off but uh i still had a really good time and i really res- I, th- th- my main takeaway is i really respect the hell out of these mechanics for a game from 2010 like this is really really impressive i thought this game was came out in like 2015 or something oh, okay, the fact yeah. it was 2010 really blew my mind when i i looked it up yeah i think limbo was 2016 i want to say same inside. year as on i uh, sorry yeah inside was 2016 same year as uncharted 4 i want to say um, yeah yeah I remember I played inside in a single sitting in an evening. I wasn't actually a single sitting. I played it, then I had dinner, then I finished it after dinner. Um, have dinner. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it was just so singular. And I, I, I do remember Limbo taking me a few more sessions of like, you know, trying to get to grips with it. Um, but because I think I played Limbo a little after when it came out, um, I, I, I got a little more frustrated, I think, with some of those elements mm. that you identified, mm. right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, totally. Which makes sense. Um, totally. Oh, that's great it's another one ticked off the list which is good um yeah. what's what's left on the list but i know you have inscription on there oh, that's God, one that you want to hit up my list um, uh, but there's i think there's still just a few of those kind of indie classics yeah that, so you know, you've covered a lot of them but there's there's still these are the games that i've i had on they were on i like i had a list of um deku deals i made the list of like these are oh, indie out. games that have come out in the last i don't know four or five years that i need to get to that um i'll just put them all on the list and then when they go on sale, I'll just buy them. So that mm-hmm. included Cut of the Lamb. I talked about that. I've got a little Gator game coming up. Um, unfortunately, that game came to Game Pass. So Yeah, I was going to message you being like, whoops, well, you went um, a bit too early Equally, I'll, I'll benefit from a bit of handheld gaming in my bed yeah. um, on the Switch. So that's fine. Inscription was on sale. I now own that on PS5. Oh, that's, nice. Okay. That, I'll play that soon-ish. Oh, gosh. The Messenger. Um, I obviously loved Sea of Stars earlier this year. I'm really intrigued. I mean, super interested how you kept to that because you're playing it post sea of stars which is kind yes. of the reverse of a lot of people yeah so, yeah so yeah. i kind of know all the story stuff it links to already which is yeah. interesting um i've got that on xbox waiting for me uh and then obviously stuff like danganronp i'm going to play for ah, my yeah. um uh game trade because you have to yes, yes. but yeah. the two big ones i'm or three big ones i'm looking out for to go on sale and i would love to get to this year are dredge um a highland song because mm. scotland and yes. dave the diver i really right. want to get to those three games um nice. probably play them all on switch although i know dave the diver doesn't run the best on switch and it's right. about to come out on ps5 yeah probably um, best to wait for those ports to come yeah I think. and something yeah. i've noticed in my um monitoring sales era as we call it uh-huh. um, yeah. <laughs> is games are generally just a couple of quid cheaper on ps5 and i don't really know why yeah it's um, weird isn't it a yeah. lot of them are so that include that's why i bought cult of the lamb on ps5 that's why i got inscription on ps5 like when these mm. games go on sale they're just a couple of quid cheaper than uh, the other platforms so there's definitely some sort of weird xbox switch tax yeah going on a little bit yeah but... so there's definitely a switch tax 100 percent a switch tax uh, yeah. for a lot of games because pepper grinder was more expensive on switch than it was on steam um ah, so right yeah so yeah, but it wasn't too bad for me because obviously I think the nice benefit of Switch is um, fucking points, baby. You just get points. So get points, I, yeah. I never spend full price for a game on Switch because I always have some points from something, you know. It's like um, a permanent 5% off, isn't it? Yeah, which like, 
I hope they don't fucking get rid of that for the next console, man. It's so good. Like, it's a real... It I nice. think it's a real incentive, honestly, for buying games on Switch. Um, I think it's it's saved me... It's probably saved me, like, £200 over the years. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it's mm-hmm. that high, mm-hmm. you know? Like, there's a lot of money being saved through that. So, hopefully they... Um, I've also that. been playing a bit of Mario Golf on the Game Boy Color. Oh, I'll nice. Okay. get to that another time. Um, Sweet. So, yeah. Good times. Good times. That's, those are my gaming plans um, Great. for the coming months. Yeah, I did, um, I mentioned it on the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the vlog, not audio log um, that I did, but I did play a bunch of Eastwood Octopia on the plane yeah. over to uh, GDC, um, which, yeah, I felt like I got a bit more of a groove with that, but um, I want to finish that off, and then I'll come back and talk about it, I think, on the show uh, once I'm nice. once I'm done with it and I can talk to the, the whole of it. But I think I've made a good dent now, so I'm probably getting close to uh, to hopefully wrapping that up at some point. But, um, yeah, that's, that's on my calendar. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know if either of you are going to play princess peach showtime i have this voucher that i've got to use uh before mm. may the third or whatever it is when did tears of the kingdom come out last year tales of kanzara zao coming out april 23rd and i am mm. super interested how that scores yeah definitely jan um, ochoa at giant bomb said mm-hmm. it felt better than prince of persia to jump yeah i game. don't know about that i played the demo on steam deck and obviously the steam deck demo didn't run very well so i didn't play it for that long okay. but I definitely disagree with that take. Um, so yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll see. A few games feel as good as Prince of Persia. Yeah, it's pretty slick. It's pretty slick stuff. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll see some some stuff on the horizon, uh, and we'll uh, we'll be jumping into it. But um, we are going to take a break uh, right now, and we'll come back after that with some of your emails. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. everyone and welcome back to the second segment of today's show it is that time again it is emails i must say there are two ways of contacting the show two first way email us your email address is this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com the second way we have a discord server join the community have fun we've got a great community growing over there There is a channel. It is called emails. You can post a comment, a question, an email in that channel. That is the second method of contacting us. You can join the Discord server. There's a link in the description of this show. Join it. You'll love it. We love to see it. Don't you love it, MBZ? Very methodical approach to the emails this week. It's just straight to the point. It's like, (laughs) this is how you do it. This is an instruction video. How (laughs) does one talk to us through internet? Here you go. Bally presenting it to us. Lovely. Good stuff. Our first email is from Discord. It's hawksbill underscore JB says, with the news of Crazy Taxi being a triple A game, it got me thinking this should be a free to play live service game with skins for your taxi and driver, knockout style gameplay, etc. You could even have squads where one guy is the taxi driver and the teammates are passengers that have to help their driver or hinder the opposition. What franchises do you think could benefit from the dreaded live service tag? 
Hmm, interesting. I like the uh, the flip on the idea of like, what what's a positive thing we can say about <laughs> live service games? Um, yeah, it's really interesting that um, that Sega stuff, right? Because they was it the Game Awards where they basically it was the Game Awards because I was fucking sitting there and I was like, <laughs> I was I was having a fever dream. I was like, are they announced to announce the fucking Dreamcast too? Like I was I was legit like a, a Sega announcing a fucking console. It's like a weird quick highlight reel that went way too fast. Yeah, yeah. So they they showed like basically nothing of like seven games or whatever it was. Um, one of them being Crazy Taxi. One of them being Shinobi, which actually looked sick. Like it was like a two D animated take on Shinobi. And I was like oh that actually seems like it could be quite good um that's the one i'm probably the most excited for from those but um a crazy taxi is interesting i don't have much of a history with it um aside from the yakuza games which basically rip it off and make it into a mini game inside mm. their own game um but uh there was a crazy taxi simpson i think it was road rage a crazy taxi oh yeah it was one of my most played games on gamecube was yeah. simpsons road rage uh yeah, that game is really cool. I played way too much of it. I, mm. I, I can I can you make it live service? Yeah, like I, I think Crazy Taxi is like one of those interesting franchises where it worked in the PS2 GameCube era because of the simplicity of it. Mm. I feel like a, bringing back Crazy Taxi these days, like how do you do that? Because it is so arcadey, right? In its very nature and very arcadey. Like yeah. how do you give it? You know how do you get xp when you do great like you almost have to you have to modernize it in a way that makes sense and so i kind of understand this approach that hawksbill is talking about is like well if you live service it but then like how does that work i, I guess, think the person? way it works is the dropout idea that they've suggested where because you have multiplayer in crazy taxi or simpsons road rage and mm. it's basically you're racing each other to pick up passengers and drop them off However, if you say you have, I don't know, 20 taxis and there's 19 passengers, it's a bit like musical chairs. And then someone gets knocked out and you just keep going. Like that could mm. be pretty cool where you have like 19 passengers. Therefore, one person doesn't pick up a passenger and is knocked right. out of the game. Uh, and kind the of fun thing. Battle Royale approach almost. Battle sometimes. Royale, exactly. Yeah. And the fun thing about Crazy Taxi or Simpsons Road Rage is you can steal the passenger of an opposition car by bumping into them that's like ah. how you did it um on top of the fact in simpsons road rage your car would drive more slowly when you had a, a passenger than when you did not have a passenger i right. would play this quite a lot at christmas and new year with my cousins and we would always work out like how do you keep catching me it's like oh because i don't have a passenger and all the cars are the same speed but then when right. one doesn't have a passenger they all catch uh, up okay. so, there's mechanics you can do that I think could work well in some sort of battle royale format mm -hmm. like that, but who knows? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, if we think about Nintendo's franchises, I think a lot of people are like, but can you do a proper job at live service, though? Because I think there's there's this weird... There is a game. It's called F-099. It's uh, fantastic. Uh-huh. But are they doing a proper live service job? Right? And I guess, I guess we have to define, like, what is proper live service? Because... I think it's a really interesting conversation that's been happening recently around Helldivers 2 where mm. you know like the the whole ethos of that game is there's a surprise to the live service element of it like they don't they don't tell people that stuff is changing just, you just get sniped by a new race out of nowhere and everyone's yeah. like where did that come from oh right like they they put out an update but they don't give patch notes of what's that's in the awesome. update you so know cool. like it's it's such a such a smart way of handling it where like the feeling of something evolving and you discovering that evolution is it just feels like so much it, it honestly to me like when we think about the way in which breath of the wild broke open world convention like i feel like helldivers is kind of breaking live service yeah, convention in yeah. like this is what live service should have always been and this is what it, it they're kind of redefining what it can be right um like, like imagine that last of us thing did happen factions and you're just with like a squad you're taking on some zombies and then like a brand new faction appears out of nowhere from some other city or yeah. a, a brand new fa a race of zombies that just suddenly gets uh -huh. you know like and like only a few players see it initially and then people right. are like what the fuck are you talking about you know um, yeah it's like, such a cool concept but you do that in a zombie apocalypse world like this does feel like an evolution. Like, we've done the whole alien invasion thing. That's awesome. Helldivers 2 sounds like it's doing it incredibly well. But yeah, like, what about zombies? What about racing? What about all these other genres that could be live, ac live action? Um, 
like free to play like uh, live service like it's the the possibilities are endless and yeah i think it'd be interesting how that evolves in years to come and just quite how far behind the curve nintendo actually are <laughs> yeah like because because they have such open goals ready right like i think animal crossing is such an obvious example of like okay like they didn't they didn't really live service it they had the support was so minimal they had one year of things but like the things were things that in a previous animal crossing game are just part of the year you know like yeah it's a christmas event well yeah that's that's animal crossing there's always christmas stuff that happens around christmas because there's a calendar system you know um so i think i think there was some negative ones where people like if i yeah. pick up one god damn more egg i'm gonna oh my God, lose the fucking my egg fest everyone was mad about the egg festival because it was the <laughs> one where most people were playing the game yes, right exactly. um and so there was a lot of frustration around it and yeah there is just so many easy wins you can have for animal crossing when it comes to you know furniture that gets sold or just new items and new villages and new bits of story that you can drip through those like i feel like there's such possibility space for that idea for that world like almost makes me wonder if like ea's approach with the next sims game is going to change in that sense if they want to have something in, uh, uh, that vibe i know sims is quite different from animal crossing but like i don't know there's there's something you could do with a more connected more uh online version of that where you know parts of your city talk to another city and and how it interacts i think i think would be quite cool so mm. um so for me, I think Animal Crossing could really benefit from the live service tag because at the end of the day, what we currently have is a game that is static where every year the events are just repeats of what they already are. There's a limited content pool of what people can say to you and what things you can buy. And by making it endless, by opening it up to the live service model, it allows you to create that evolving sense of a community and of things happening and of new stuff being added like it, people already play animal crossing a lot but i think they would be so much more engaged and interested and like they nintendo they like money they can make so much fucking mm. money from like live servicing animal crossing in a smart way in an ethical way but in a way that that rewards you for continuing to play it right yeah um, i think it's, it's the obvious one for me totally totally I think they've also dropped the ball a little bit with games like Splatoon. Like yes, yeah. Mechanically, Splatoon is in an incredible multiplayer shooter game that just doesn't feel like it gets the active. And when we say like active, it, it is that difference between Nintendo's methodical plodding. Here's an event we're all going to get excited for in a month's time versus <laughs> Hell Divers 2. There's this new alien race attacked us out of nowhere, and this is uh -huh. so sudden and surprising and interesting and exciting. Like, there's just such a gulf in the nature of how the live service game is changing and evolving. And, you know, say Splatoon 4 launches in the first couple of years of Switch 2 can kind of predict what it's going to be right like oh, yeah. it's, it's a bit depressing they'll just follow the same playbook which is like we'll have splat fests every three months or two months or whatever it is and ketchup versus mayonnaise oh whoa, whoa, what a fun choice uh which you know we shouldn't mock it because back in the day bally the fucking everybody votes channel i mean come on everybody is there, votes is there a better channel yes. on the Wii? no is there a better channel on any television no the everybody <laughs> votes channel the greatest of all time but um but yeah it, it, it is I mean, you know, Splatoon, Animal Crossing, I think they both fall into a category of Nintendo games, which is, this mm. makes a lot of money, we're not going to change it category. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it kind of sucks because there is a lot of potential in the same way for Animal Crossing, for Splatoon, to have it evolve and just be supported more consistently mm. and more interestingly, right? Like, what if, like, the updates for Splatoon were just a bit more significant in terms of what they added in terms of like brand new game modes or things like that yeah, like things yeah. that would get me back to the game that i currently you know i think you know we have just a problem where we just don't go back to stuff anyway so even if they yeah. did that would probably be hard but I, at least i would think about it at least i consider it more whereas like today i'm like oh i want to play some splatoon oh i'm just playing some more turf war and i'm playing some more of this and that and you know it's kind of the same as i did last time and it's still enjoyable but it's not not a new reason to come back to the mm. game and i think mm. new reasons to come back to things are 
the thing that Nintendo are lacking, I think, in a lot of their franchises and their approach um, to multiplayer generally. Right? I think um, one game that has made me desire another game even more is playing Fall Guys has made me want to see a Nintendo take on that. And the Nintendo hmm. take I think that would work the best is a multiplayer Mario platforming game. Now, 3D Mario platforming. 3D Mario yeah. platforming. Mario 99, right? Mm, mm, here we <laughs> Where go. You have like 99 Marios in a world and you see a flagpole off in the ooh, open world ooh, distance. Oh, yes. Oh, Valley, marks yes. get set, go. Give it oh, the control set of like Mario Odyssey and oh, let's boy. just have some crazy ass buildings and shapes and things to climb and platform. Oh. And let's give re- let's give real rewards to everyone in say the top 30. Like every single jump matters. Even right. if you're in 99, you can still make it to the top 30 and make this a mode as part of say Mario Odyssey 2 or whatever is next who knows but like and support it give new levels give costumes give un- other unlockables and really invest in like making it interesting like we mm-hmm. just said about Helldivers 2 like this random alien races car and nowhere and attacked have something live in the world that suddenly does something like a yeah. massive giant mecha bowser who cares uh-huh. something like just something like that or like um, what if you've got you've got some underwater level and no one's ever seen it before and the massive mario 64 eel just comes out of nowhere <laughs> yeah. just like interesting things like that that are just still taking something for what nintendo is famous for and the best at which is in, in our opinion 3d platforming yes and taking an idea like four guys but putting a nintendo polish on it giving it more energy and support it in a real meaningful way mm-hmm. yeah no I, I love that idea i think it makes so much sense and for that reason they are never gonna do it <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. uh yeah i because um... they had like the weird luigi balloon thing yeah which was basically this idea on the smallest most crap scale possible um, <laughs> yeah, it was just the shittiest version like of any of this yeah so i don't know yeah no i i, I like that a lot and um i think that you know there's it's a way in which life service is it's just detrimental i think sometimes to the people who work on those games yeah. because that's the mario team sorted for the next three four yeah. years never to work on anything else right you know, like... and like that's part of the reason why naughty dog decided oh we're exactly. not gonna do this thing because it takes up so much time yeah. um it's funny and... how it took them so long to work that out yeah yeah exactly it's like, wait a minute um, how are we gonna make the next naughty dog game oh right yeah, <laughs> if we're making we this game this for project. 10 years instead yes. yeah um it's why stuff like I think there's also just unreasonable expectations from players because of games like Fortnite, where Epic has so much money and time and resources to mm. actually that you know you think they would they're fucking cutting jobs like left, right, and center. But um, you know, like the the frequency with which they change that game is it's almost unfair to everything else in the market. Like it's just a, such a rapid pace. Like it's built for the TikTok generation is built for people's attention spans disappearing off the planet with how fast you can change things or they change things within Fortnite. and you know you see this complaint from communities of like oh halo what's going on why is it taking so long for all this stuff and they're just not built in the same way that epic has built their Fortnite team to just be on top of it 24 7 just constantly updating non-stop new thing new skin new map being changed it's just it's New a little concert. bit breathless <laughs> yeah exactly it's, it's it's just it's it's not healthy for other games to try and do that but because they have set an expectation they've set a bar everyone else has to try and meet that bar um and yeah no no one can so yeah it's kind of kind of sucks i think in that way um so anyway um my hope is that we get a uh live service xenoblade game that never ends so that i always have uh <laughs> big giant uh gods to explore uh so there you unless go. it's an mmo it feels like kind oh my of the god Bally. genre possible fuck to me into. if they made a xenoblade mmo i i'm sorry i just wouldn't play other video games i think i would just i would become a full-time xenoblade mmo player um, so <laughs> that's it that would be my end there and it then. would it would be over i'm sorry guys it just like <laughs> unless you want to just hear me talk about fucking xenoblade mmo every week that's it that's my life so yeah um 
But, but yeah, great. Gr- great question, Hawksville. Hopefully, hopefully we, we, we shone some light on the possibilities uh-huh, um, or yeah. the, the nightmares. Whatever yeah, way you yeah. want to take it. Um, sure. Our next email is from George B., who's from New York, and they made clear it's the western part of the state and not the city. Uh, I'm George, and I'm 14 years old. I'm a very new listener. I found the show after the first episode in December, but I was hooked. A couple of weeks ago, I decided to watch the backlog of the show, and I am on episode 33 now. I listen while playing games and washing the dishes. Great jobs. Love, love a bit of dishwashing and um, what, listening to pods. I have a question. Wouldn't it be better for the next Nintendo console not to be a Switch successor? I feel that it makes more sense for Nintendo to remain innovative. I would feel that we would be stuck with another seven years of no innovation in hardware, in hardware from Nintendo. I don't think the Switch 2 could sell more than 60 to 80 million units because not everyone will be willing to upgrade. Shouldn't the goal be to match or surpass the Switch's success? I think it could be cool to go back to having a console and a handheld, but in the, in the sense that the handheld would be a Switch 2. However, I do understand that this may not be a logical step for Nintendo, but I would love to see it. I also play my Switch almost uh, always in docked mode, but often play older consoles instead of the Switch. As a physical, physical collector of retro and modern games, I still appreciate the idea of virtual console, but I do not appreciate the idea of a subscription service. I would much rather buy the games for a fixed cost and then still be able to play them when the service inevitably discontinues. For me, a perfect system would be a connected collection of virtual console across the console and the Switch, as well as the ability to buy the games outright or a subscription. I think it would be a uh, great to manually customize which games you are buying the service for and the price would go down by a few cents when you remove a game. What are your thoughts? Thank you for the hundreds of hours of content uh, to listen to. You guys are great. Uh, also, I am sorry for your lo- for the loss of your Bluetooth speaker, MBZ. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we held a wake uh, for the speaker, just, um, you know, sang some songs, uh, sent it off into the, into the night. Um, I, I have to say the new speaker that I have, um, remarkably similar uh you know it is wider. Okay. it is it is it is bulkier it is wider it is like a little more annoying to carry around it's it's mad how quickly and i've noticed this with moving house how mm-hmm. quickly you fall into a new routine yeah and yep. before the routine has fallen into it is the worst thing imaginable but when yes. and the transition is not that much fun but no. then once you're in it it's like oh okay this wasn't so bad yeah, and there's like weird benefits to it, right? So like previously, when I uh, was waking up in the morning and I turned on the podcast, I would have to like slightly open my eyes and press the play button on my podcast to start it because the only way to, or I would have to get my speaker and tap the top of it, which in the morning, you don't want to do a big motion like tapping the top because you're still tired trying to wake up to like get it to and play. And you talk to it. No, I did. So, Bali, at one point in time, I was asking Google to play my podcast in the morning. <laughs> and it worked. It worked beautifully. I but... remember we were at, were at Gamescom or something. I can't remember mm-hmm. where we were at, but you were yeah. just like, Google, play my podcast. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like... yeah. 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 And it works. It worked for me. But here's the benefit of the new speaker it has a button on the top that's just a play button. And so when I wake up in the morning, uh-huh. I turn it on, and all I have to do is one little finger, click, and it starts playing. And I'm like, oh, Oh, my life is so much better. That's nice that it's a button. Buttons are a yeah, dying yeah. breed. Yeah, I know, right? So I was, I'm, I'm very thankful that it's there. Um, the problem is, like you know, like with the last speaker, because it's a button, it means inevitably I'll press it seven oh, million God. times, yeah, yeah. and it will in ten years break down in the same way. How often do you press the play button for a podcast? Every I Sunday? know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but for now, like I can like still be in my state of half awakeness and press it, and like go. oh my god, the joy that it gives me, I it's it's immeasurable, frankly. Um, so. So that's good. Um, uh, also, I just want to say, uh, yeah, George, for a fourteen-year-old, far more switched on. Yeah, I think, I know, than we were. Like, <laughs> this is a great old. take. I think yes. George makes some really, really valid points. Because uh-huh. um, ultimately, like Nintendo are the master innovators. Of and course. It for whoever is designing the next console. Let's assume it is the Switch 2 and it's fairly in in line with the rumors mm-hmm. and it's fairly in line with what the Switch does. You can tell that for a Nintendo console designer, that will be the most painful, uh-huh. frustrating, um, un-Nintendo thing to be making a successor that is so close to the original and 
don't get me wrong they have done successes that are very similar to the original um uh either game boy to game boy advance uh nes to super nintendo there are there are examples in history but they are few and far between and i see the logic of you can never beat 60 to 80 million units with the same unit because not mm-hmm. everyone is going to want to upgrade it. Therefore, you need to diversify. Right. And that means everyone will want it. I get that logic. Yes. Um, I mean, the proof is in the pudding because every console that has been a sequel to a successful console from Nintendo has sold worse than the previous one, right? The 3DS did worse than the DS did. The Super Nintendo did worse than the NES. The Wii U did significantly worse than the Wii did. Every time they have a hit console mm. and they do a follow-up, it always goes poorly. Um, it always is worse. Or it goes before. well, but not as well. Exactly, yes. And the Super Nintendo is a good example of that, of like, yeah, it did good, but it didn't do as well as the NES did. Um, and it was a downward trajectory from that point. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point, because I, I think, you know, we talk about it all the time. Majority of people who own Switches are casual people who don't understand graphics or frame rate or anything. They like Mario and they like Mario Kart and they play it with their kids. And for those people, there is no reason to upgrade to a Switch 2. And if it's the same thing with no differentiator, there's no reason. They just keep it. They just keep their, their first one and they're like, this is great. I'll keep playing this for 10 more years, you know? Um, and so that does lead to a shrinking market which there is you know i think that's what people have been saying about the games industry is like there are not a lot of new players being created in the games industry it's a lot of the same people buying it again mm. and again buying consoles. and these same people um, only have a finite of hours to play right. games in yeah exactly um and so i think nintendo did chart new territory with switch and have have brought on new audiences with it which is cool um and obviously they're a they're a uh games funneling like they create new players more so than any of the other platforms, right? Like, kids usually have a Nintendo console. If they're going to get into any console as a kid, you're going to have a Nintendo console, most likely. Um, if you don't, you have a fucking iPad, right? And that's what you play stuff on. Um, so they are they are really the funnel into the industry. And so people come on board with Nintendo, and maybe they then get to the age of, you know, 11, and they're like, oh, that PlayStation's cool because it has blood. Um, but, yeah, they they kind of... They build an ecosystem in a way. And so, yeah, having something that is so similar, I think for a kid is less interesting. Because I think if we think about us as kids playing Nintendo games, like I was so excited for the Wii because of how different and weird it was, right? Mm -hmm. And I was so excited for the DS of like, two screens? Like every time they did something, it was like, oh, I've got to get that because it's just so, like I've got to try the 3D. We we drank the the Innovator Kool-Aid hard yeah like, oh very it, hard it worked for us and, and i think that that is what kids want kids want fun weird stuff right like yeah i'm so it, jealous of friends with ps2s with the eye toy i was like that's a nintendo yes, invention exactly. look at that shit like it's yeah, totally. definitely got nintendo energy um yeah we just loved to innovate um it was great yeah yeah totally um so so i think yeah there's there's some valid thoughts here i think the idea though that nintendo are just going to make a Switch 2. Let me tell you, that shit ain't happening. There's going to... Look, we talked about it before. There's going to... They're going to find some fucking way to make this weird. And you all know it. You yes. all know it. We all sit here and are like, ah, oh, this will be a Switch 2. No, it fucking won't. No, it won't. It's, it, it, can, it, can, it can be both at the same time. It can. It can. Like exactly. the 3DS. And I think that's what is the most likely scenario here is like, it's going to be a Switch 2. But then there's going to be something and everyone's going to groan. Everyone's going to go, ah, oh, of course. But, but the, you know, the inner child in us, MBZ, will yeah. be rejoicing. And we will I be, absolutely, yes. every time. And I love that. And, and that is why Nintendo, for me, are still the most interesting company to follow in the games industry. It's the company I care the most about and will continue to, I think, for the rest of my life because they have this just inability to stick to the straight and narrow path. They just want to go and just do some fucking weird shit. And I love it. Like, I really do. I think it is just so interesting. Um, And especially because their competition are just so fucking boring, right? Like, okay, <laughs> yes. it's cool. It's a, it's a better graphics card. Like, yeah, great. The thanks, games, guys. The um, yeah, like, the, there Zombie is just... Games. There's no innovation from a hardware space. I mean, maybe that's a little unfair to what Sony have done with the DualSense, because that's really cool, right? Like, I really do appreciate yeah, that. But, yeah. but, you know, at a fundamental level, 
those guys are just making PCs every time. And Nintendo, <laughs> they, you know, they're not. They're, they're doing something else, and you know they're going to do something fucking weird this time. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it will be something. But, you know, it, 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 I still think it sta- the point stands, though, right? Because the 3DS was like, holy shit, 3D without glasses? And it turns out no one fucking liked that, and I was yeah. like, you know... Apart from us. <laughs> apart from us, again, the people who would just, like, shout about it from the rooftop. Um but like you know it was fundamentally still a ds and so i think a lot of people saw it and were like i have a ds you know i don't need that um, mm. and yeah i think i think that's the challenge it's a really tough challenge because you have such a massive install base with this first system and i don't know i wonder if part of that you know thought behind the account system and carrying stuff over is that desire to sell upgrades to people um you know because Everyone is so used to the phone cycle of stuff. Uh, and I think a lot of people have talked for years about, like, what if game consoles gone to a more phone-like cycle? I mean, I, if that I don't is, think they will, but... If we are getting know. to a point where consoles become the phone cycle, I think Nintendo are going to be the last company yeah. <laughs> to get to that point, And it's going to yes. be, you know, Sony or Microsoft. But, 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 but I mean it more so in the sense of, like, there's a continuity that you have and there's a okay. confidence in buying the next thing because you know that everything's going to carry over all the money you spent on switch those hundreds and hundreds of dollars on games you're gonna keep them right because i think that's a lot of people with iphones is like oh i have all this stuff and i don't want to move out of this ecosystem because mm. i spent all the money so it it ties you it locks you in right um so yeah i, I mean what if it's not the hardware that gets people to buy the switch successor but the software and you know mm-hmm. what like what's what's the average parent's attitude to like oh there's a new mario kart that my kid wants but he or she already has mario mm. kart why would i get another mario kart and the kid's like because the new mario kart's got samus and different tracks <laughs> <laughs> oh shit dude fuck dude samus that's gonna happen you know like I, I, is there a possibility that you know changing up the software can drive insane numbers of sales on the new hardware or does mm. it have to be a combination of a new mario kart but also like you said switch successor is gonna have some sort of gimmick that is just that right. crazy innovation on top of the fact that they're also going to have some really safe games like i don't know the next animal crossing pretty safe right like you're right yeah 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 is that the success that is the, that that almost trilogy of where aspects are gambles but other aspects are really safe yeah i mean the switch kind of was that in a sense right like the switch was i mean the switch was a gamble as well but it was really like, okay, what if we refined this Wii U idea, okay? Mm. <laughs> like, what if we, mm. we took this and we just, like, shaved off some stuff and just made it work this time? Um, but we'll still have uh, Switch Sports and yes. uh, one two Switch and ARMS, you know? They, they, right. They... The, I, th- I think the difference with Switch was that the gimmick wasn't a weird method of uh, interacting with games. It was a... It was a tried and true method of interacting with games, but you could do multiple. You you could basically just take that idea of handheld and and you know like. But the way that you you can still use it and forget about it. You couldn't really do that with the Wii, right? It's not a. It's not. It doesn't fundamentally change the way you play games from a control standpoint. It just it gives you the freedom and the flexibility to decide how you but you're still playing games with buttons and an analog stick right at the end of the day mm. it's not like the ds touchscreen it's not like the wii's waggle it's it's a it's a tried and true it's a traditional approach but the gimmick was oh what if you could do it in bed and then at the, your tv that that was mm-hmm. the difference and um and i think that you know th- they still had weird there's a fucking ir sensor on your joy cons right why is that there because koizumi wanted to fucking eat an apple and then like make it happen on the screen at the same time like right like that's, that's why that, has it ever been used since fucking one two switch I, maybe in um the fucking uh horse game uh three force what the fuck is it called uh one two switch switch, switch up oh two, i can't switch, fucking bar. i played uh, that way forward game that i can't remember the name of oh yeah yeah caroline yeah. and there yes. was ir sensor bollocks in that game. oh my god okay it was weird yeah um, and yeah. i had 
drag Caroline to the finish line of that game. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kicking so, 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 yeah, like, the fundamental gimmick of Switch was pretty plain, but, like, you have Joy-Cons with HD Rumble, you have the Joy-Cons themselves as a detachable controller. Like, there is still a lot of weird Nintendo funkiness in the Switch. And I guarantee you there will be weird Nintendo funkiness and whatever the successor is. Mm. Because they always want to put something different in there. They have to have a point of differentiation. Um, and... I think it's just going to happen. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. Um, mm. Interesting question uh, that's asked about subscription versus virtual console um, mm. and having the option for both. Um, I mean, I think it doesn't make sense for Nintendo to do it, right? Because... Like there's just no going back, is there? That right, because if you, on if you offer now. people the ability to buy something piecemeal versus subscribing and having a temporary access to it, I think it depends on the person, right? Like, most people will be like oh i i played mario on game boy when i was young i want that and they're like that and then i say it stayed subbed for the next three years without playing any more games right and that's the thing right like they if you get them on the subscription then you get a recurring payment yeah. even though they're only it's playing mario membership. land 2 yeah. versus if you give them mario land 2 they buy it and then they never spend any more money in your store anymore right um so i think yeah we are going to be stuck with this system i i'm okay with it personally because it's i grown, always I was like just dipping into stuff for old games anyway. I'm never going to, you know, unless I have a desire to be like, right, I'm going to play all the way through fucking, I don't know, Jelly Boy. God forbid I have to play Jelly Boy, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, it, it, I was glad I got to play 20 minutes of Jelly Boy and then I can come on the show and be like, you shouldn't play Jelly Boy. It's a bad <laughs> video game, you know? Like, I think that's, that's nice. Um, I wouldn't have spent my money on Jelly Boy is what I'm saying but I can play it if I want. Yeah, if I really yeah. want to go sicko mode, I can do it. Um, yeah. And, you know, all the all the ones that people would have bought anyway are on there. So it's like, oh, there's a link to the past. If I want to, I can play Super, uh, Super Metroid on my um, Switch. You know, that's great. I, I love the fact that I can be on a plane and be like, ah, oh, I really want to play some Metroid Fusion. Oh, guess what? I can play it. It's, it's right mm-hmm. here, um, which is quite nice. I just um, pray I that, that, you know, Nintendo Switch Online is something that they just keep continuing and adding to rather than starting over the piecemeal release of titles again and again like Mm. i do think there's a possibility a slim one that they do carry it over more or less as it already exists right and then add stuff to it like there are still loads of games not on that system they're still not the gamecube for example like there there are possibilities of other consoles other games that they do keep adding piecemeal and the piecemeal thing, it does annoy me, but I, I appreciate the marketing beat they get out of it. Like, it's undeniable that there was a few people talking about Mario Golf on Game Boy Color. That's kind mm. of cool because yeah. it happened at that point in time. I get that, and I yeah. appreciate that. But let's just not start the piecemeal again from the, from the start. N- Nintendo have a, they have a real incentive to not start it again because here's a situation, right? If you're someone who had a Switch and you're subscribed to the service, say you go on to the next system. If they don't have a service for you to subscribe to, you become a lost customer because you cancel your subscription on your old Switch. Exactly. And then you don't have anything on your new one. Like, it doesn't make any sense because they're just losing subscribers if they do that. And so, it, you know, we say this a million times and Nintendo always does a weird thing, but like logically surely this time (laughs) they have to keep it because they have an incentive to keep you as a subscriber through the console transition you're going to have the new shiny console you're going to play your two launch games you're going to beat those two launch games you might not go back to them straight away and you're going to think what am i going to play on my switch 2 in the meantime oh well i'm still subscribed to switch online let's go play some mario golf on game Mm -hmm. Color because it's there it's convenient i'm there's a satisfaction to playing on the new system regardless of the game it is occasionally yes, where yes, you've already beaten the hotness and you just want to what indie games on here like it's we right. were already pumped about a game like golf story for example it's maybe mm. a bad example but we bought that game partially because there was a fairly limited number of indie games it's, it's, what was that game i bought initially. in the summer the summer of switch one Snipper there was a Clips? game no it was a it was like a Mega Man type game from way um, forward i want to say right, yeah. um and I bought that, and in no other year or no other platform would I just buy that at full price just from an eShop. Mm. But there was nothing else to play. But like the Switch was the new shiny 
thing I had, and so I wanted to play something new, shiny on it, right? Yeah. Um. So, so I think that it just such it has a big factor to play. Um. And I think you know, if you, if you do bridge that gap by having everything carry over from subscription, by also having all of your games carry over and be backwards compatible and downloadable and playable, right? You know, like yeah. that that fills the void. It fills the gap and. You know, Sony, Sony have done it. What if the... they charge you money to carry all your games over? Well, at the very least, they've Valley... Not, they've done it in the past. You have to pay an upgrade fee. At the very least, we can guarantee that there will be an animation of some fucking Pikmin carrying that. <laughs> then it's all right? worth it. <laughs> it's all fucking worth it because I get to see the little Pikmin carrying it to the new system. Um, yeah, I... Yeah, I think it has to. I think they have to. Um, and... I, I don't think they can charge. Like, this is the thing. They're, they've got so many new customers. All these new customers are going to be like, what the fuck is this bullshit? Are they charging us? I think they have something like 35 million subs or something ridiculous. Like it's huge. It's Switch huge. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, I <laughs> against my better judgment, I have hope. <laughs> but but your happen. point is right. They want to do everything in their power to stop those 37 million people just cancelling their subscription because, right. you know you can i'm kind of predicting the wave of we're nintendo fans and we're canceling our subscription because they're making us pay like they're doing piecemeal game releases again we are right. canceling and it makes a big wave on the internet and actually only impacts about i don't know five million out of the <laughs> yeah, 35 yeah. million totally subscribers i can i can just see that coming and yeah i right. don't know i don't know but who knows yeah who knows yeah um well good stuff uh excellent question thanks george for writing in and uh yeah man i wish i was that smart <laughs> 14 hey we started listening to podcasts when we were like 18 yeah and good luck with your um backlog catch up yes yeah absolutely um so uh yeah there's uh hey there's a lot turns out we've talked a lot on the internet over the last 10 years so that's, really have. Uh, really have. it's a huge amount uh to to listen to if you so want to go through that um but if you so want to end listening to this show, you can do that right now because it's the end, baby. But before we go, Bali, where could they where they go to send these emails to if they want to do that? Please send your emails to thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. Like I also said at the start of the segment, we have a Discord server. There's a channel. It is called Emails. Join the server. It's in the description. Go in the channel that's called Emails. Leave a comment, a question, and we will get to that on the show yeah absolutely um so that is going to do us for today's episode but of course we have some things to talk about and shout out and all that sort of stuff uh, such as you can go to patreon.com slash this nintendo life and get bonus things for example i did an audio log at gdc uh, in san francisco it's about an hour long and that's at the five dollar tier so if you want to get on there uh that's usually where i put that that stuff is at five dollars so i'll probably do one for japan i'll probably do one for what other events i go to this year i mean mbz um, has got a lot of events lined up so that yes. is a very valuable tier i might add yeah absolutely so there'll be some fun stuff uh, going up there um and it's basically just like whenever i get a, sh a chance i basically pull out my phone and just start chatting about something that's happening um and uh, it's good fun i enjoy doing those basically and, uh, the the um los angeles audio log that's yes your, your, i'm away from home yeah exactly so you can um you can go and listen to me just waxing lyrical about how good america is and just, like, <laughs> the best things about it so um no it's, it's good fun I, I enjoy doing those so check those out and um yeah there's there's lots of other stuff on there as well bonus episodes all that uh fun stuff uh bali um we however would like to thank some of our patrons yes thank you to all of our patrons it is hugely appreciated uh, the support you give the show but i need to shout out some new patrons yes uh we have a new patron andrew b uh, and we also have uh, orange thunder i should say that an existing patron but they moved their patrons up to the ten dollar tier very very cool uh and shout out to andrew uh, andrew is the person who i met at gdc who recognized me as nbz uh recognized so that, uh, your actual face uh-huh uh-huh yeah uh, which face. was uh <laughs> fucking crazy uh so yes uh shout out to uh to him and uh hey thanks for hopping on uh, onto um, the podcast so yeah Very that's cool. awesome andrew thank you thank you for the support um i mm -hmm. need to give a shout out to our ten dollar tier plus patrons as well and we said they are zach s thomas matthew albert wicked gamer uk allen turtle orange thunder and 
I stick him at the end because it just is hilarious every time. Um, at the end is Ali T. Um, Ali T. So yeah, thank you all for your den- ten dollar tier mm. plus. It's been a uh, been a while since we had an Ali T update. I think he's playing CS Stars. Yeah, we can call out. This is how we communicate with Ali T now. So yeah, Ali T, give us an update, and we'll yeah. say it on the next show. Yeah. So yeah, he's playing Sea of Stars. Um, I haven't checked my Switch to see his hour count yet. We did recommend Sea of Stars. So we yeah, did. Yeah. He 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 wanted an RPG. Um. So Sea of Stars was a good. I think good he one played a short hike. After he did. Yes. Recommendation. Um. He was posting on Discord, so we recommended yep. that, and mm-hmm. I think then we recommended Sea of Stars. I tried to get him on Octopath Traveler, but it wasn't. Yeah, you did. You tried but... to do the hard sell, but then Ali T's like, I just want something chill. Uh, Octopath like, is not chill. It's, it's not, not. It's absolutely it's not, not chill, chill at all. No, it's like one of the most hardcore RPGs. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, that's that's good stuff. So, um, yeah. If you want to recommend more games for Ali T, just let him let him know. Um, but I'm sure he'll he'll be looking for some more in the future. But uh, yeah, that is um, that's Patreon. So go ahead and support that if you so wish. Uh, you can of course go and find us on the internet. Um, I am at Lord NBZ on all the platforms except for blue sky where i'm at nbz uh where are you bally i'm on twitter at the ballyman 91 that's b-a-l-l-y-m-a-n 91 and that's my same name on blue sky lovely uh you can find us uh on twitter as well at tnl podcast uh, to follow stuff about the show what's happening um and uh get access to uh, a link to the discord and our youtube channel um so if you want to join the community or find uh you know that listening on the computer is better i believe george who uh wrote in this time talked about uh having it on uh or watching the podcast which implies to yeah. me that they uh, find it through youtube which is cool um so yeah you can if you want to have it in the background on youtube then that's a good thing to do as well um and uh yeah you can uh, find us on other platforms all across the internet such as spotify stitcher uh you can I'm getting download. a bunch of spotify reviews so yeah thank you for those yeah. i should say ratings is ratings ratings yes, up on yes. there um, little five star rating always appreciated yeah absolutely uh so go ahead and do that and you can find us uh wherever good podcasts are sold as they say uh and uh subscribe uh which means that yeah you just get into your feed every couple of weeks and it's a good time it's a good fun time uh and that's it that's gonna do us uh for this episode um i'm being a bit all over the place with my gaming plans i think final fantasy just kind of like took a fucking big dent of my uh, like my march going to japan is gonna throw it all up in the air again potentially but, but like i i'm gonna bring my switch i think to japan it feels right to bring that and not the steam deck it, you know it's it's a japanese console i've mm. got to take that you know um and i've got a few things on there that i'm wanting to dig into i um start of this year i got uh started on bayonetta Ceresa and the lost demon and um i was really enjoying it but then new stuff came out and kind of threw me off so i want to get back to that um and i have a few other things on there that i would like to sparks play of hope. yes i still have sparks of hopes chilling uh a few few Skyward games there. Sword. i am not going to play skyward sword because i cannot play that handheld because okay. you have to do motion control i will not abide by this bullshit using an analog stick for skyward sword <laughs> it is frankly a crime against the game and uh you know must be motion control that's how that game is supposed to be played but um but yeah i've got a few things on there that i will be digging into on my japan trip um but uh but yeah um yeah lots of stuff coming out uh and uh we're a bit all over the place but the show will still come out we've got some plans yes. yeah um so just check out the feed and we'll sort you right out yeah we'll probably just update next time on on the plan and stuff like yeah. that but um yeah. mbz's going to japan i'm going yep. to ireland yeah one one both islands i guess so mm-hmm. that's exciting yes. <laughs> yeah exactly uh so yeah look forward to that stuff uh and uh yeah we'll be back in a couple of weeks time with another episode for you talking about nintendo video games and everything in between till then thanks for listening and uh, we'll be back soon bye bye
The musical interlude used on today's show was Bug Boss from Pepper Grinder. Copyright Devolver Digital 2024.